Hello and welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast series brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. My name is Saiduddin Faridi. I'm a research analyst at ISAS and I will be your host for today's episode on India-Nepal bilateral ties under the backdrop of Nepal's Prime Minister's visit to India. Nepal's Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal's four-day visit to India, which began on 31st May, marked his first foreign visit since he took office in December of last year. Prime Minister Dahal, alongside Prime Minister Modi, announced several projects and expressed their aim to take the partnership between the two countries to Himalayan heights. Historically, the relationship between India and Nepal has been unique. The countries share an open border, strong people-to-people ties, Indian currency is widely used in Nepal, both the countries have strong military relations, and India is Nepal's largest trading partner. However, the relationship is not devoid of its issues. In 2019 and 20, the two countries issued maps with overlapping territories, which became a point of contention, and the 2015 border blockade uh, resulted in a low point in the relationship. At the same time, the China lens is omnipresent when looking at this relationship. Given this background and the discussions held between both the sides, the recent visit is being hailed as a success. Several agreements have been signed, particularly concerning trade and electricity. To discuss this visit and the wider India-Nepal relationship, we have with us Mr. Amish Raj Malvi, author of the book All Roads Lead North, Nepal's Turn to China. Welcome to the podcast, Amish. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Pleasure to be here. I think we can begin the conversation by establishing what the importance of the visit was. So, what is the significance of Prime Minister Dahal's visit to India and why has it taken so much time for him to land in New Delhi? I think, I mean, that this, this, thing, that, this thing that it's taken so long, I will not agree. Uh, I mean, it's his fourth visit as Prime Minister, right, to... Um, Firstly, the coalition, the ruling coalition has taken time to form itself. Uh, initially, there was a different coalition, uh, and now, uh, and then uh, one of the supporting partners, which is Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Oli, he pulled out of the coalition. Then the Nepali Congress joined in, he had to t- retake the trust vote. So I think the coalition took time to form itself. And then thereafter, there were also the presidential elections that were happening. So there were lots of equations around that. So any foreign visits by the Prime Minister seemed to be deferred until the these modalities were sorted, right? But in terms of significance, I think, as you said, uh, we've seen long-term power deals, uh, plus the trilateral power purchase, there's a go-ahead on that. So Nepal will be able to sell power, 40 megawatts of power to Bangladesh through Indian transmission lines very soon. India has committed to buy 10,000 megawatts of power if in 10 years. There are new infrastructure connectivity announcements. Uh, cross-border digital payments seem to be uh, getting a, a boost for now. There's a new transit agreement that allows Nepal to use Indian waterways. And there is an acknowledgement of the border dispute from the Indian side as well. So in terms of significance, I would say I would list these. But in terms of the overall bilateral ties, I think what this visit did was it's also suggested a reorientation of ties focusing on the economic connectivity aspects more than the political which is always loomed on the horizon in India Nepal ties. So, and once the Prime Minister has returned here to Kathmandu, there has been opposition which has rallied around these political aspects, right? But to me, I would say that the real big breakthrough was in the economic sphere, especially in power trade and connectivity. Now, the key question is implementation and how soon implementation can occur, whether they will be expedited or not, and how soon these power deals, deals will translate into reality. So I think it is it is significant on those lines, but yes, implementation will be key as always. Uh, so like you mentioned, uh, energy was an important area of discussion, and uh, you also mentioned the projects, the uh, uh, 480 megawatt hydropower project, India is committed to buying 10,000 megawatts of power from Nepal, and the trilateral energy trade, which will commence. Uh, so in, in those terms, how would you put the significance of Indian power market for Nepal? And we've seen that there have been some reservations from the Indian side previously, so how would you characterize those? 
Uh, so I'll give you, I mean, you mentioned that this 480 megawatt, uh, this Fukur Karnari hydropower project on which there was an MOU. I think one way to understand it would be that Fukur Karnali was originally listed as a BRI project uh, to be developed by China, but it has not seen any movement since the, since 2017, which is when yeah, Nepal signed up to BRI. And so its license has now been awarded to an Indian company. So one way of looking at it is that since, 2015 when the blockade, India has taken the lead in Nepal's hydropower sector. Uh, Nepal has been exporting about 450, 500 megawatts of power right now uh, at the moment to India. But soon, uh, by 2025, Nepal is expected to be a power surplus uh, state. And the primary market of that energy, that power is definitely India. Right. Uh, primarily also because the fact of geography makes it so it is easier to uh, build transmission lines across to India. And there is, of course, the Indian demand for power as well, especially clean, pa cleaner power, which is growing rapidly. And hopefully the other the trilateral part of it, this 40 megawatt deal with Bangladesh is just the beginning. Uh, once it starts off. As Nepali power, let's say the power capacity, the power production capacity expands, and we'll we'll have multiple markets via, let's say, India. So that is another potential as well. So like I said, uh, currently India and its companies are in a much better position in Nepal's hydropower sector, and it has seen a sort of role reversal since the days when China and its companies were engaged in big hydro discussions and contracts. But in terms of reservations. The primary reservation has been that India has blocked market access to China and its investments in Nepal. So India is not buying any power from hydropower projects like Upper Tamakoshi, where, which has been developed by Chinese contractors even. So it, it has pretty much said that it will not buy power from projects with any sort of Chinese involvement, even at the contractor level. And I think Nepal currently then faces a dilemma over how to overcome such reservations because Chinese contractors, well, they are among the cheapest and across the world. And if they bid for projects over here and they get the contract, will India buy them? Will India then buy the power or not? I think that's a big question that's looming over uh, Nepali, let's say, power developers as well as the power policymakers. But let's see, I mean, how it goes from here on. Connectivity beyond electricity has also received a push with the inauguration of the cargo train between India and Nepal and the progress on integrated check posts. How are these initiatives likely to strengthen economic ties and bilateral relationships between India and Nepal? I think for this for this question, we have to go back to the larger idea of South Asia, right? Like, I mean, culturally, all the countries in South Asia are very, very similar, but Economically, I think we are almost one of the most disintegrated regions in the world, even 70 years after, let's say, countries in the region like India, Pakistan uh, got their independence. So any infrastructure possibilities that will boost economic integration, bring South Asian markets closer will definitely, let's say, be a positive point. Now, specifically in terms of Nepal and India, as you said, like India is Nepal's largest trading partner, almost all imports come through India, including petroleum. So, and we've seen that in 20, through 2015, that India's most pressing leverage in Nepal is its economic, let's say, dependence, right? Nepal's economic dependence on India. So Nepal obviously has concerns regarding these long-term economic relationship with India, especially after 2015. But these connectivity projects, including oil pipelines, uh, what India has done is it's sought to reassure and assuage Nepal that its concerns will be, will be addressed. Uh, we have to remember in 2015, one of the most visible signs of the blockade was the shortage of petroleum in Nepal's cities, right? So I think through these oil pipelines, India has sought to reassure Nepal that, all right, we will address your concerns. But there is, of course, the caveat. The caveat is that, the caveat is that India's concerns regarding China and other issues are also reciprocated for Nepal, right? And we've seen, like I said earlier, the power the power purchase, obviously there is, a, there is a dilemma that Nepal will be facing in the years to come. So essentially the challenge now from here on for Nepal is to ensure how it can reassure both India and China, especially at a time when the two countries aren't really comfortable with each other. So 
again like it is a, a, like with a lot of things that happen between the, in this state visit once the implementation starts let's say working itself out once these projects starts let's say like i mean actually translating into real time operations then i suppose a lot of these issues will be smoothed out but for now these are challenges that this will be one challenge i see with in facing nepal to balance both india and china in the years to come that is uh, quite interesting because um assuaging the, uh, these concerns for nepal and building trust uh, between the two countries is important considering um, after the 2015 episode so if we've seen that uh, connectivity and uh, energy are very important discussions but there are some issues that have remained unaddressed so what are those uh, issues uh, as seen by you that uh, that were not discussed during this visit between india and nepal so of course i mean the primary the primary issue was one of uh, new air routes right especially new air entry routes into nepal uh, nepal has been actually i mean it's been 9 years since the day that prime minister modi when he was first elected in 2014 he came to nepal and during at that time the joint statement between the two prime ministers actually said that within the next 6 months new air routes would be announced and it's been 9 years now almost getting to 10 years right so it is still not worked out and nepal has been demanding this for a while and india this is this is i mean this this particular issue of another air an alternative air entry route into nepal is a vital concern to nepal right the second issue that should have been discussed but wasn't was also the new airports inside nepal in bairava and pokhara uh, and air connectivity to india from these airports now bairava and pokhara airports are both developed by china uh, bairava in the case of bairava Uh, it was an adb loan but executed by a chinese contractor but in the case of pokhara airport it was an epc contract under which it was a china exim bank loan developed by china campsi engineering right now india has reservations as i mentioned earlier india essentially is blocking chinese uh, uh, market access to chinese companies through nepal right so it does not seem to want to encourage uh nepal uh to let's say engage with chinese contractors and builders in future infrastructure projects and i think its hesitation in bhairava allowing air connectivity from bhairava and pokhara is stemming from that so india has been hesitant in flying agreeing to fly to these airports a breakthrough was expected but didn't come through and the other fact is that Indians remain the highest foreign visitors to Nepal and in a tourist tourism heavy as a tourism dependent market like Nepal these airports primary market will be India so their non operation is actually a setback for Nepal at the at this current moment what i would say here is that i think reciprocity on both these issues right will say that India is keen to address Nepal's concerns now these issues both air routes and flying to these new airports they are not big ticket investments or they they don't require extensive political dialogue so the quicker india addresses them the more amenable nepal will be to its concerns as well because there are larger let's say political issues such as the boundary dispute that you mentioned as well as the, there is an epg report as well as there is the recruitment of nepalis into the indian army now these issues are political issues but unless india sort of seeks to resolve these smaller let's say low hanging fruit for lack of a better word right these issues these larger big ticket political issues will still let's say be become grow more intractable so i think the ball is essentially in india's court on these uh, let's say air routes and the air connectivity issues uh, so um coming to uh, a, like you meant like you said a larger issue which is the border dispute at kalapani between the two countries so in this context uh, how do you read the comments from the two prime ministers who have expressed resolve in addressing the issue during their meeting no so see as with most border disputes right the fact that the indian prime minister acknowledged that there is a border dispute between nepal and india suggests a breakthrough in india delhi's position on the issue right because till now delhi had been saying that all right any dispute should be resolved through bilateral mechanisms which is all fine but it hadn't really let's say address the fact that the a border dispute existed now the indian prime minister himself has said that all right we will resolve all issues including the border right which means that there is a breakthrough on that of course this border dispute has to be resolved 
through established bilateral mechanisms. It cannot be politicized any longer. But what has happened is that once the Nepali Prime Minister has returned, he has made some premature comments you know, regarding land swap, regarding certain, let's say, like, I mean, ideas through which this border dispute can be resolved, that suggests a lack of coherence on the Nepali part on how to resolve it. You know, it has essentially the border dispute has become politicized and it cannot be politicized anymore if Nepal wants to resolve it with India. That's for sure. All right. Uh, I think my final question to you uh, would be that how do you see this visit in terms of the changing geopolitical dynamics uh, in South Asia? Okay, so two parts to this question, right? The first is the Indian response, right? Uh, the in India has, I think, until a couple of years ago, or rather about 10 years ago, India was seeking to contain let's say China's influence in a very different manner that it wasn't even willing to acknowledge that already China had a place in South Asia. But I think now what's happening is that India has started adapting to Chinese influence expansion in South Asia. So it has started emphasizing these economic and infrastructure connectivity projects. It has stayed away from domestic politics of neighboring countries. And it's ensuring its partners in the neighborhood know sort of realize that long-term engagement with China will have its cost vis-a-vis -vis bilateral ties with India. So especially, like I said, with Nepal. But that does not mean that China is not in the picture at all. Uh, but what has also happened is that since the Sri Lankan and the Pakistan economic crisis, this high cost of Chinese capital has obviously sort of made other countries in the region like Nepal wary of, of Chinese capital. So political engagement by China has continued but you have, there is a sort of distinct slowdown in the economic engagement with China. So that's the larger, let's say, the big rate power perspective, right? But on part of its, on the South Asian, let's say, ecosystem, the South Asian neighbors, the smaller countries, there is also a feeling that Indian interest in the neighborhood is no longer predicated on just having a friendly government, right? Or, but on economic, on expanding economic connectivity. That has its own cost-benefit analysis. But India's neighbors are also, they seem to be keen on capitalizing on this revitalized, revitalized Indian interest to expand regional connectivity. So actually, I mean, Bangladesh and Nepal power trade via India is a great trilateral regional model that can be emulated in other regional, let's say, like areas of the world as well. So smaller countries in the region will continue to hedge their bets against the bigger, two bigger neighbors. Like I said, I mean, Nepal will have to, let's say, assure both India and China in the days to come. As seen in Bangladesh, you can also have situations where China and India are both investing in the same port infrastructure, right? So it is, it's not necessarily a, a game where a larger geopolitical game where decisions or let's say the outcome can be immediately understood. It is a sort of a, uh, the, 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 the rules are constantly changing. The, the, uh, India is made, taking certain decisions that, will, that are affecting its smaller neighbors, but its neighbors are also reacting to these decisions in a certain manner. They're sort of trying to figure out, all right, what is the best way that we can engage both these you know, the countries to our best benefit or to our best, let's say, like outcomes? So it, it, it will, South Asia will definitely be a very interesting region in the days to come for sure. Yes, I think that answer quite well encapsulates the evolving dynamics here in the region. Thank you so much, Amish, for joining us and for your nuanced views on Indian-Nepal ties and on South Asia in general. This has been quite an insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you for hosting us. You were listening to South Asia Chat. You can learn more about our work by visiting us at isas.nus.edu.sg. You can also get updates on our research and publications through social media. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.